Kids who grew up with a lot of conflict in the house often grow up and land in high conflict relationships. If you got used to shouting and animosity between your parents or even violence, it may feel normal to you to be in relationships where you get shouted at or where you actively dislike your partner. Every couple has disagreements and conflict is, you know, it's natural and healthy. It's part of relationships. But how do you know when a healthy level of arguing has gone too far? My letter today is from someone I'll call Belinda. And um, she writes, Hi Anna, I've recently discovered your YouTube channel and wanted to write in for your advice. I'm grappling with whether or not to end my relationship. I'm 38 and have a good but not very close relationship with my parents who divorced when I was about five. I've never had a diagnosis of CPTSD and I'm fortunate to have never experienced anything like some of the terrible circumstances, abuse and neglect that some of your viewers write about. I feel very selfish for saying this and I'm sure my parents would be shocked and horrified to hear that I relate to so much of what you describe about emotional dysregulation and struggles with interpersonal relationships. Well, don't worry, Belinda, uh, you are in the right place. And I, I'm circling here a couple things you're saying so I can come back to them. I'll read your letter all the way through and then we'll come back and, and I can help you with what you tell me. Okay, so I do believe I grew up in a loving household, but from the youngest age I felt very sad and quite alone. I was timid and afraid of going to school, going on trips, to kids' parties, etc. I think I had quite an anxious attachment bond with my mother. We spent every second weekend with my dad, and there were many tears about that, as I rarely wanted to go. I'm sure the tears and tantrums put a lot of pressure on my mother, who had to work full time. I just remember being very checked out as a kid, and I remember my mom shouting at us a lot. The only memory I have of my dad being at the house was when my mother called him one morning that I was crying and didn't want to go to school and he came over and beat me so much my mother was afraid to send me to school that day in case teachers noticed the red marks on my skin. I think I'd have been around seven years old at that time. As I got older, weekends with my dad frequently devolved into tears and my mom having to come and get me. When I was around 12, I learned that my dad had had an affair and that I had a half-brother. I was 18 before I finally shared this information with my mother. I naively thought she didn't know, but of course she did. His affair was the reason for their divorce. My mother also had some health problems when I was younger, breast cancer for which she had radiotherapy, and later cancer of the neck, which was also treated successfully. My grandparents used to help care for us a lot while my mother had treatment. Nobody really spoke about it. My mother just sort of quietly went through it. And, and that's just how my family dealt with things. Just get on with it. Looking back, I think my mother must have been miserable and struggling with illness, two kids, a house, and a job. As you can tell, this isn't a story of terrible abuse or neglect. I almost feel embarrassed writing to you. But so much of what you talk about in your videos has resonated with me. In my teens and early 20s, I used to sleep around a lot. I didn't have a proper boyfriend until I was 20, and the first time we broke up, I had a major meltdown and almost took my own life. Okay, the next serious boyfriend I had after that, I married. He was 10 years older than me and a kind, steady, reliable sort of person. With hindsight, these were definitely the sort of qualities I need in a partner, but it didn't work out as intellectually we weren't a good match and had few things in common. After my divorce, then in my early 30s, I met someone who was head over heels in love with me, but he almost certainly had CPTSD from living with an abusive alcoholic father. The early part of our relationship was very difficult and took a huge emotional toll on me. He was very possessive, controlling, and emotional, and I had to walk on eggshells to keep the peace. I felt like I compromised myself in that relationship and let him trespass on my boundaries, such as my privacy on more than one occasion. The pain I felt at the end of that relationship was similar to death. It took me two years to build myself back from it. I have now been in a relationship that just started casually, just sex, before we realized we in fact have quite a lot in common. He had just come out of a serious relationship when we met, so he wasn't looking for anything serious. He was very domineering and opinionated. Whereas I'm more passive, He's black and white thinking, whereas I'm open-minded. 
We have many shared interests and he impresses me with his honest, straightforward approach and lack of fear. He's very mature and emotionally aware of himself and he has supported me enormously. Since we've been together about eight months now, I've been in the final year of a degree which I found very stressful and have been struggling with my anxiety and depression without medication which I stopped taking shortly before we met. Ah. He's, he has many qualities which I admire and there is much good stuff here, but here's the rub. His certitude and domineering personality leaves me feeling utterly steamrolled at times. Arguments frequently erupt because he's so quick to offer his opinion and advice before listening to me. If I don't agree with his opinion or follow his advice, he takes it as rejection. He works on a building site and I can only describe him as an alpha male. And his tone and way of speaking is quite rough generally. He's blunt sometimes to the point that I find unnecessary and hurtful. But on the other hand, I do value his honest approach. The trouble is that when I take a similar tone with him, he doesn't take it well and very quick to point out, whereas I would generally let it slide. This has caused many arguments which, due to my emotional dysregulation, leave me utterly wiped out. I end up stuck in bed, unable to engage with life at all, and my studies have suffered as a result. I know that these emotional reactions are dis disproportionate, but at the same time, I'm wondering whether he is the right partner for me because I get so triggered. I've tried to tell him how he invalidates my feelings by saying it's just me being sensitive and at the same time doesn't realize how sensitive he is too. I guess I'm wondering if it's a red flag that we argue so much about how we're arguing and not about anything major. I just need the communication to feel different for me, to feel secure. He has a very strong voice in our relationship and I'm worried if I can't make myself heard and understood then he's the type that could easily walk all over me. Should I be worried that our styles are so different? We've been able to resolve arguments well and have both done our share of apologizing, but they have become so frequent that there is less and less will on either side to try to communicate more effectively. I'd like to find a better way before all these arguments take such a huge emotional toll on me. Your advice would be much appre appreciated. Belinda, thank you, Belinda. I think I can help. <laughs> I do have experience with this. And this is a tricky one. I don't have a perfect answer for you here. I think it's gonna take some time of discernment here. Um, so, but I circled things you said. Let me come back and just repeat some of the things you told me. You never had a diagnosis of CPTSD. Most people haven't. It's a self-identification based on symptoms. So some of the things you mentioned where you say, you kept saying you're embarrassed and ashamed that you shouldn't have problems. So that's interesting. You have this stoicism where you believe that you have an obligation to not be as hurt or wounded as other people and you're comparing what happened to you to what happened to other people. But one thing we know for sure is that different people are different. The same circumstances can cause people to turn out quite differently and look at siblings in the same family, right? So it's okay, you just are how you are. And if you relate to the symptoms, the thing about here at Crappy Childhood Fairy, I don't really focus that much on what happened to people. Like people give me the background and we have a little information. It's like, this is what I come from. But I, when people send me letters, I'm always like, you know, keep it kind of short with the background. Just give me a couple reference points. I want to hear about the problem today. That's what I can help you with because what happened in the past, it's done. Other people did it. So we can't go back in time and we can't change how other people are, even if they're still alive. Even if they want to change, it's like the wound happened. So now what I teach people to do, regardless of anything they do about healing the past, is to heal the way it's affecting them now. So what happened to you, you know, you have a strong feeling it affected you now and that makes sense to me. Something happened to you. Um, perhaps you were a very sensitive kid, but there was a lot of crying around your kid's divorce. I don't know if you know this, but just parents splitting up is a trauma. Also, your mom having breast cancer is a huge trauma and going to the hospital, people not talking about it, having to go live with your grandparents. I'm glad they cared for you. Yes, yes, grateful, blah, blah. But oh my gosh, your mom had breast cancer. How terrifying. How scared everybody must have been around you. And even if you were a kid and you didn't understand what everything meant or what the prognosis really was, the fear everybody felt would have been very destabilizing to a kid. So you know what? You get to identify with the symptoms and you get to go on the assumption that, yeah, your childhood had enough uncertainty and pain and worry in it that you, you struggle with these things. So that's okay. 
you're fine. You're in the right place. All right. So you had to go see your dad. You used to cry. Then you found out he had an affair. And I've been talking about this lately. A lot of people who write to me, there was an affair. There was infidelity with the parents. And I don't think that gets talked about enough, that whether the marriage survives or not, it usually doesn't. There's a real hurt to the kids about that. There's something primal that is disrupted by, it, by that betrayal and dishonesty between the parents. The kids are imprinting on that. And I would just speculate, this is something that happened with my parents too, I would just speculate that there is something very important that we're threading together about how we trust people, how, what, a, what a relationship looks like, what the trust and openness and realness between two people is. Affairs are, you know, they are hidden by nature. They're hidden. It's all lies. Little kids are not, they can't always understand the information and the words, but they sure feel the vibe. They can smell it on people, the lie. And, and so when grown-ups are saying one thing, but you can feel with your senses, like something's, no, this isn't true. Something's not safe. Or go to your dad's. No, I don't want to. I feel terrible there. When people aren't letting you acknowledge and support you in responding to your feelings like that, you learn to shut them down. So that's a wound that was done to you. And now here you are, you're going to start healing that wound and you're going to begin to know your feelings and express yourself and stand up for yourself, even if you're clumsy at it at first. All right. Because we all are at first clumsy at it. It comes out, I was, it's like a teenage period when we start to go, I have a boundary. Stop. Don't do that. Don't talk to me like that. Sometimes we find out it's like, oh, that boundary, it's kind of like I was overstepping. So sometimes that happens, but that's okay. We must go through this phase of development where we learn how to, we learn what we, who we are, what we deserve, and we learn to defend it and fight for it if we have to. And so it's my opinion and this only is true for me now that I use my daily practice techniques twice a day. If I'm using my daily practice techniques twice a day, which helps me to get honest with myself, I read to my mentor sometimes and get feedback. And over 28 years of doing this, you don't have to be 28 years before it benefits you. I think it could help right away. But after many years of doing this, I have more trust of myself that I can express what I really think. I also have developed a lot more consideration for other people in, in these years. So what's given me confidence to say how I feel and fight for myself and stand up and say, hey, not cool. No, you don't get to say that. You know, I do that. My mother's from Brooklyn, right? I'm married to a guy who's from Northern England. We have very culturally different ideas about how to have a disagreement. I'll just be like, hey, da, 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 you know, <laughs> my grandparents were immigrants. They were from Norway, actually, which is not a super expressive country, but they lived amongst all these people from Italy and, you know, people who did express themselves. And that's how my mom, my mom came up. She's, her language was peppered with all these Yiddish words and Italian words and foods. And so, you know, I come from this like melting pot environment that my mom grew up in where there is self-expression and for people who didn't have that, who had something more reserved, it feels like too much. So I'm not invalidating that his intensity is too much. Like I'd have to see it, right? I think it's hard to judge somebody else through the eyes of their partner, strictly speaking. And you're not describing your abuse. You're just saying he's kind of an opinion bully and he just, he, he, he has his opinion and it's so strong. But when one person hasn't been free to express themselves and the other person is good at expressing themselves and you have that dynamic, the one who expresses themselves will feel like they're bullying, but that's not necessarily what it is. They are just expressing themselves. If you didn't grow up that way, you're probably never going to be super like, hey, this is how I feel. I'm emoting. You know, I'm telling you my opinion. You might never be like that, but it's possible you could get more comfortable with it. And the question is, because you're just like, where it is right now, it's grinding you down. That's not acceptable. That's not a bad sign. You said, I don't want it to make me feel this way. I, that's a good impulse. You don't want it to make you feel the way that you're feeling. So either he has to change or you have to learn to be more accepting of who he is. Or this is the most likely positive outcome, if you can find it, is you meet in the middle. That he tries to be more mindful that his intensity and the opinions and you know, hitting you with them. And when he notices like you're not saying anything or you start to look like a deer in the headlights, if he could become more aware and pull back from that. And a partner who loves you can work with you a little bit on that. But it's not really realistic that somebody can stop being who they are. 
And self-expression is one of the fruits of healing that you can say what you really think. Even higher than self-expression is consideration of others. Now some people, they never get self-expression, they just consider others, that's codependence. Some people only express themselves and never consider others, that's selfishness, right? So a mix in each person and listening to each other and meeting in the middle. It's okay that you guys have different styles. If you find that no matter what he does, you still, you know, your life is just crumbling apart, that is a red flag. That sounds like you might not be compatible. But you say you like his forthrightness. After all that deception in your family, I imagine that's refreshing. So I see possibility here if you can find it. I would encourage you, if you wish, to check out the techniques I teach for calming triggers. Because sometimes if people are acting a certain way that's triggering, you can ask them to stop or be considerate. That might get you some success. You can just decide to like put up with it. That might get you some success. The most powerful thing that I've ever done about getting triggered about things is I use these techniques, the fear and resentment uh, writing. It's a special technique. Don't try this at home. Take the course. It's very specific, followed by meditation, where you can just start kind of like unwinding something that wound you up. You unwind it. You get lucid again. You're not forgiving anything bad that happens. You're not losing your boundaries. You're not just going, oh, I accept everything. You're just getting a bunch of the sort of like the, the intense trauma-driven reaction, just kind of like out of the way. So you can go, wait, how do I really feel about this? And uh, you may find, like I did, it's very, very, very helpful. And it's free. It's something that you can do anytime. The course is free. It's called The Daily Practice. It's on the free tools page of my website. There's also a link to it sort of in the middle of the description section under my videos. But try that and see if you can, if your triggers are maybe adjustable at all. They may not. I'm not saying you, you know, I'm, I'm not trying to gaslight you into saying it's your fault or anything. But if you love this guy, I think it's worth a try to start working on those trigger symptoms. And you know, the way you grew up, I would just say, of course you have triggers. Of course. I mean, everybody has some, but really after what you went through, they're there. So we're learning to, and also where you say you just sort of like checked out as a kid, checking out is like not expressing yourself. I'm sure it wasn't safe. I mean, who gets to express themselves to their parents? Not very many of us. So, <laughs> so, so now's your chance to heal this. You guys also might want to check out couples counseling. You know, I don't mean to just like state the obvious, but couples counseling is a great way to get a little bit of perspective on like, is this, you know, is this crazy? Is one person taking advantage of the other? So I told you when I started answering your letter here that this was not a black and white case. This is, <laughs> this is a, well, I don't know. You're going to have to do a little bit more discernment here. And if you decide that you're not getting the consideration and the sort of like meeting you halfway thing that actually makes it possible for you to be at peace and enjoy this relationship and enjoy your life, then for all practical purposes, his relationship for you is opinion bullying. It's just too much. I'm not trying to say that your boyfriend is an opinion bully, but you might decide that he is. To help discern that, you might want to check out this video right here, what to do about opinion bullies, and I will see you very soon.